Hi, and welcome to this part six of our series of videos that are all about making a screw jack for your home shop. Now, in today's video, we're going to start by, well, we're going to be completing the project today, but we're going to start by working or on the base. Not quite getting it done, but we're going to start by working on the base. And since not everything is always all about that base, well, we're going to then move on to completing the body. And then we'll come back to the base and complete that part. All that will be left after that, well, is our final assembly and giving ourselves a pat on our back. But before I get to that, I think it's important that I switch out of my everyday fish through the head hat and get my Canada Day cap out. Ooh, ooh, 3D effect there. Because today is Canada Day, July 1st, uh, 2016. I just mentioned the year because you might be watching this in reruns. Uh, so July 1st, 2016, it is Canada's 149th birthday. So to all you crazy Canucks out there, happy birthday. And keep your stick on the ice. And to everyone else out there, well, I'm sorry you couldn't live in the world's greatest country. But what can you do? Sometimes you just have to deal with it. For us, let's get back to that project. So we have our part, the one we were working on in the last video, our base, and what we want to work now is on the back side of this base. We have to bring it to its final length, so surface some material off. We're going to have to center drill, drill, and bore our diameter for threading, and we're going to have to produce a chamfer and a counter bore on this end. In what order am I going to do? Well, oddly enough, I'm going to start here by center drilling and drilling. Why not start by surfacing? That is what most people would do. Surfacing is not a very efficient way of removing material quickly. It's a compromise. Unless you have a variable speed machine, one that accelerates as the tool approaches the center, you never really have the proper RPM for the cut you want to take. In other words, if you set the RPM for the proper RPM on the outside diameter, well, by the time you get to the center, you're way too slow. And that is what you're going to do. Because going over RPM, well, that is just not acceptable. Under, we can live with. But it's not efficient, because what do I do to compensate for that lack of RPM as I come towards the center? Well, I slow down my feed. And it just takes a long time to cut that material. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to drill out the center to 7 eighths, which isn't the diameter that I want, and I want it to be nice and concentric. So I'm just going to drill it out as a rough hole. And since the center of this part will no longer exist, I do not have to surface down to that center. I can really take some material off with a proper feed and a proper speed, and it'll go a lot quicker that way. Remember, drilling in a home shop is usually the fastest way to remove a lot of material. So we have our part and it has been rough drilled and surfaced and I'll probably produce that small chamfer on it seeing as I'll have the tool set up to do that. That little 45 degree chamfer on the hex I mean. Okay, so that'll be completed. What next? Well I want to bore that hole out to its proper diameter. Now the hole here that I'm producing is for a 1 inch 14 class 2B thread. Not to be or not to be to class B. B meaning inside thread. What we cut the other day was a class 2A. This is 2B. Okay, a lot of people here would just get the tab drill chart out and bore the hole out to the tab drill size and that is a big mistake. Now if you have a turned thread there are specific diameters to respect that aren't the same diameters as a tab thread. Now if somebody asks for a turn thread and not a tap thread, well you're going to have to get the proper minor diameter. 
And for that, in the case of this 1 inch 13, no, 1 inch 14 uh, 2B thread, well, we look in our machinery's handbook and we see that the diameter that we want, the minor diameter for this thread, should be situated somewhere between 0.938 thousandths of an inch and 923 thousandths of an inch. And for us, well, we're going to shoot somewhere around 930 thousandths of an inch. And for those operations, well, I'm going to be holding the part by this finished diameter, and I don't want to damage that diameter. So I've made myself a small split ring here with some aluminum that will protect it from the jaws when I clamp it down. So let's head over to the lathe and take a look at those operations.
Now, as you can see here, I have my small boring bar set up, and it's set up in a way that it protrudes from the face of the tool post just enough to clear the back of the part. That means that when the edge of the tool post here comes close to the surface of my part here, well, I'll have done my cut as far as depth goes. That's important. You have to give yourself some reference points like that because when you're boring, working on the inside of the part, you are working blind. So it's good to know where you're cutting to and this will be a clear indication. Another important thing to remember for a novice machinist is that we're working on the inside of the part here. And that means that we're going to be cutting from small to big. Now, we're not used to that. When we work on the outside of a part, we work from big to small. Uh, not this time. We're working from small to big. And that means that my tolerances should be aimed for a little differently. Now, I'm boring this for threading, so I'm heading or I'm shooting for the middle of my tolerance. But this, if it had just been a bored hole, well, I would have shot for the lower side of my tolerance when I'm working on the inside. And if I were working on an outside diameter, well, I'd shoot for the upper side of the tolerance. That way, if I have a little problem, well, it gives me a little bit of play to work with. So my tool is already set up and I'm not going to explain it more than that. I mean, you'll see what I'm doing as we cut. But remember, we have a video that talks about attack angles for uh, lathe cutters and in that video I have a small section about setting up tool heights uh, internal comparatively to external. It's a little different and it's good to remember if this is your first experience with boring that keeping the tool short as short as possible is crucial and that even if you're very careful it never really cuts quite as nicely on the inside of a part as it does on the outside and that has to do with clearances. You need a lot more clearance when you're working on the inside of the part. So let's get our safety glasses on, get back to work, start boring out that 930 thousandths of an inch hole. eight hundred and ninety three thousandths of an inch so that would mean that I still have about for nine hundred and thirty I still have about thirty seven thousandths of an inch to come off of here So my part is bored to its pre-threading diameter, 930, actually it's 929 thousandths of an inch, but that is more than good enough. So we're bored out and I still have a boring operation to perform. I have a counterbore to produce on the end of that hole. 
but I will not do it now. Why? Well, because I want to use this base as a fixture to hold the body that we were working on last week to surface its second end and produce its second 45 degree chamfer on its hex uh, surface. So, if I do the counterbore now, I won't be able to use this base as a fixture. But what I have done here is I've set up my thread uh, internal threading tool, my boring bar for threading, and I've changed the angle on my compound rest. I've also set up the gearbox so I'm ready to go with my 1 inch 14 internal thread, class 2 internal B. So let's take a look at this setup. So I have here my thread boring tool and it's pre-sharpened 60 degree tip here and it's set up in my tool post. I've also offset my axis here to 29 degrees from my cross slide axis. So my compound rest is offset 29 degrees. Uh, why is it offset in the back of the machine like we see here? Well, it's simple. When I'm cutting, and I'm cutting an internal thread here, I would like to reduce the backlash that the axis or the lead screw of the compound rest be pushing against the tool and pushing the tool into its cut. It's just a question of backlash. So this will push the tool in the direction that it's going to be cutting. Now, it's also very important that this tool be very, very parallel to the axis of rotation of the part. It has to be accurate if we want that 60 degree thread to be perpendicular to the surface that I'm threading. Now, the gearbox has been set up to 14 threads per inch. My tool is set up properly. I think we're ready to go. So, how are we going to go about cutting this thread? Well, the same way as we've cut other threads, and we have a video about that. But this is an internal thread, so there are some differences. And the main difference is the direction of attack of the threaded tool. Uh, for the rest, while we're cutting from the tailstock to the headstock with a counterclockwise rotation, so it's a right hand thread, and while well, we're going to be cutting in the same way, my compound rest is always going to be moving forward and my cross slide axis is going to move in instead of out, in to clear the thread, come back to clear the part, come back to zero on the cross slide axis, take another cut on my compound rest, take that cut, back out with my cross slide axis, come back to clear the part, return to zero, take another cut on the compound rest. So we're going to be going progressively deeper and deeper, just as we have been with outer outside threading operations. But there is one other major difference here, and that is, well, there's two. There's one that we're threading blind, so you got to really be ready and know when to stop. And for that, well, I've set the boring bar up about the same way that I set up my other boring bar, so I can tell when I've just cleared the part, the back end of the part, that is. And the other problem, well, the other difference major is that this internal thread, as all internal threads, are, is very difficult to measure. So I'm going to have to cut uh, to a certain point and then start using, and that's how we're going to measure this, our very accurately cut male thread here that uh, I cut using the measurement over the wire. So I know this thread is good and pretty well bang on the middle of the tolerance. So I'm going to use it as a gauge to uh, measure my thread. But when do I start gauging? Well, you have to have a rough idea. If you calculate it or look in the handbook, you'll discover that at a 29 degree angle, and that's the angle of my compound rest here, my depth of thread for 14 threads per inch with a national thread form or unified is somewhere around 50, 52 thousandths of an inch. I'm not going to cut there. I'd have to be pretty uh, sure or certain or even cocky to just say I'm going to cut to the proper depth of thread. No. I'm going to use it as an indication. So 50, 52 thou is my total depth of thread. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to cut up to about 45 thousandths of an inch depth of thread, measuring on my compound rest because it goes from zero progressively deeper. Hey, I've zeroed 
the both scales of my two axes with the tool just barely touching the edge. So when I see that I'm somewhere around 45 thousandths of an inch, well that'll be a good time to start checking with my gauge. So enough talking, let's start cutting. So here I back off and come back to zero, so no backlash. I set my zero on my cross feed, uh, having touched off the edge of the part. Now I feed in for a slight cut, engage my lead screw, move in to clear the thread, come back to return to zero and take my second cut and so on and so forth. And don't forget to use your thread chasing dial.
So here we have our project fully assembled and if we look back at the original parts well we see that we have our base, our body, our head and our pivot and those parts became our base, our body, our head and our pivot. This was a great little project to do in my home shop and I'm always a little amazed at what you can accomplish with a very ordinary small lathe and a little planning and foresight. I had a ball. Now this is a great little tool and you'll probably want to have two or three in your toolbox. They're great for leveling large parts on your mill or for supporting the end of a part that hangs out of your vise. They're very finely adjustable and they're quite sturdy. So once supported you can even put a finger clamp on your part to hold it down against this screw jack. Great little tool. Also, the base is counterboard and it's counterboard just slightly larger than the diameter of the base. And that means that if you make several of these bases, you can stack them. Now they don't have to be all threaded, but you can stack them uh, and have a little more amplitude there to work with. So, great little tool. For me, well, this is the end of this season. Now, I have some personal things, family things to take care of, I have some health issues to resolve, and if all goes well, well, I'd like to be able to travel a little this fall. And that means that I'm going to be away for a while. Uh, none the matter, I do plan on coming back mid-October, late October, something like that. So, until then, have fun, be safe, and as always, happy machining. And remember, the left-hand thread on this project is mainly an excuse to force students to produce a left-hand thread. It will work with a right-hand thread, so don't make yourself sick if you can't find that left-hand tab.